Well, a while back, Lori and I uh, attended a memorial service for the daughter of some friends in our neighborhood. She was just 17 years old, and she was passionate about Jesus. And the church was packed. The crowd was a mixed bag of friends and family and acquaintances, uh, many of whom did not know Jesus. So it was important to the family that the gospel be clearly presented. Well, the pastor did an excellent job and explained it beautifully. He compared the audience to passengers on an airplane who have various responses to the safety instructions given at the beginning of each flight. We've all experienced it, haven't we? Um, While the flight attendants are giving potentially life-saving information, the passengers are fiddling with their phones and chatting with their seatmates. They're checking Facebook. Some of them are even sleeping. Only a few are actually paying any attention to where the, the exits are located or what to do in the event of an emergency. It's true that every passenger has the safety information right at their fingertips in the seat pocket in front of them, But when the plane suddenly goes into a steep dive and the cabin goes dark and fills with smoke, it's too late to be asking questions or to read up on what to do. If you're going to survive, you have to be prepared ahead of time. And so on every flight, the flight attendants dutifully go through the safety instructions knowing full well that not everybody's going to be paying attention. Well, preachers of the gospel um, are a lot like those flight attendants. The only, only the stakes are much higher. The chances of experiencing an in-flight emergency on an airplane are minuscule, but the chances of every one of us someday stepping out of this world and into eternity is 100%. The last time I looked, the ratio of births to deaths for humans was one to one. The preacher's job is to give people the information they need to prepare for that day in the hope that they will pay careful attention and take it to heart because, you see, your eternal destiny depends entirely on how you respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, there were no airplanes in Jesus' day, but people were no different then than they are now. Jesus explained the reasons for the different responses people have to the gospel in the parable of the soils in Luke 8, um, verses 4 through 15. And uh, by the way, our plan is to continue with this study of the Gospel of Luke. We may pick up the pace a little bit, but um, we're going to stick with this with study. Well, Luke chapter 8, starting with verse 4. And when a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to hear him, uh, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, Some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. Now, as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, there were probably lots of reasons why people came out to hear Jesus speaking that day. Whether they were desperately seeking for God or just wanted to be entertained, uh, they came to hear him in droves. Big crowds gathered. Now, a regular feature of Jesus' preaching and teaching was that he gave a lot of illustrations using parables. And and this parable is a little unusual in that there's nothing really unusual about it. Um, it, There's no ironic twist at the end. There's no unexpected climax. And in that agrarian society, most everyone was familiar with the whole process of sowing crops and and planting seeds. They knew from experience that a, a certain percentage of the seeds would not grow and yield a harvest for the various reasons that Jesus just described. But Jesus understood that not everyone who was coming to hear him preach thought he was the Messiah, the Son of God. They were curious about what he had to say. Some came hoping to be healed. Others expected to see a miracle or two. Others just wanted to hear his stories. So as he was sitting there watching the people arrive, he begins to reflect 
on the different responses they'll have when they hear the gospel. And even though they all will hear the same words, they won't all respond in the same way. And it was important for his disciples to know that. It's important for us to know that, who share the gospel with those around us. So as the crowd gathered, Jesus tells this parable about four soils. Let's read it again. A sower went out to sow. It went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, farming was a little different uh, back in Jesus' day than it is in our day. In ancient Palestine, sowing preceded plowing. We do it just the opposite. But sowing preceded plowing. The farmer would first prepare the field by clearing out all the large rocks and stones, and then he'd pile them up around the edges. Um, and then he would walk through the field with a bag of seed over his shoulder, and then using both hands, he'd just scatter the seeds over the, the land that he'd prepared. Now, this wasn't precision work um, at all. Some of the seed would fall into the hard-packed path next to the field where passersby would just trample on it. And the birds would come and eat it. Some seed fell where there was only a thin layer of topsoil covering the rocks just below and just below the surface. So when the seed sprouted and began to grow, it quickly withered in the heat of the sun because it had no roots and, and no moisture. Some of the seed fell into the uncultivated fringe around the edge of the field where it failed to flourish and was soon choked out because it couldn't compete with the weeds and the thorns. But most of the seed, the vast majority of it, fell on the good soil, which is where the farmer intended it to land. Now, once he'd scattered the seed, then the farmer plowed the field to till the, the seeds into the soil, and then he just waited while he was expecting a harvest of a hundredfold. Now, Matthew and Mark, in their accounts of this, of this um, parable, say that the field produces 30 and 60 and 100 fold. That's, that's not an unusual expectation. Except for Jesus' last statement, this parable is just a nice story. But that last statement, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Everyone in the crowd heard the parable and could relate to the details, but not everyone understood what he was getting at. All the speaker can do is get the message from his mouth to the listener's ears. And then it's the Holy Spirit's task to take those words from that person's ears to his heart and to his mind. These are the ones who have the ears to hear. And the disciples knew there was more to this story than meets the eye, so later they asked Jesus to explain it to them. Verse 9, And when the disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now, the others that he's referring to are just those in the crowd. But they're only intrigued and entertained by Jesus' stories, and with that, they're satisfied. They've, they've gotten what they came for. Now, Matthew expands on Jesus' answers to the disciples' questions in his account of this parable in Matthew 13, verses 13 through 15. Matthew says this, This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. 
Now, the emphasis of this parable is on neither the sower nor the seed, but on the condition of the soils and how each one of them receives the seed and what it then produces. You see, because not everyone who appears to be a Christian is born again. There are false conversions. In his explanation, Jesus tells us that the four soils represent four kinds of responses people will have to the gospel. And they're these. There are the deniers. There are defectors. There are dabblers. And then there are disciples. First, the deniers. Verse 11. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Now, the deniers have heard the gospel, but they've rejected it. Whether they are totally indifferent, politely dismissive, or violently opposed, whether we call them apathetic or agnostics or atheists, they have no interest in spiritual things. They are unbelievers who deny the gospel. Their hearts are hard and impervious to the message. So when they hear it, they just reject it out of hand, never giving it a second thought. Jesus said that's because the devil actually comes and takes the seed from their hearts. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul explains that in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The second group are the defectors. Verse 13, and the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but they have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, they fall away. They are apostates who have defected from the faith. When they first heard the gospel, they gave every indication that they believed it. They received it with joy. But when trials and difficulties come, their initial emotional high can't sustain them. They have no root, no depth of understanding, no spiritual vitality. And when they find out that becoming a Christian doesn't bring them the health, wealth, and prosperity some, teaching, some TV evangelist told them that they would receive, when they find out that the trials of life press in on them, their faith quickly withers and dies. They are defectors who fall away, and they're lost. Where there's no root, there's no fruit. The Apostle Peter also describes these people in 2 Peter 2, verses 20 through 22, where he says, For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. These are the same people the writer of Hebrews describes in Hebrews 6, 3 through 8, that was just read this morning. The writer of Hebrews says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. Now, some mistakenly refer to these people as backsliders. You've heard that term, I'm sure. 
born-again Christians who seem to have turned their back on God, but they're still saved because once they, at one time they prayed to receive Christ. But assurance of salvation doesn't depend on whether you've performed some religious act like praying the sinner's prayer or responding to an altar call or writing the date of your decision in the flyleaf of your Bible. It doesn't depend on whether you've been baptized or take communion or even joined a church. Assurance of salvation is based solely on believing and obeying the gospel, not on something you did one day long ago when you were a child, but on what you believe about Jesus Christ right now, today. What do you believe? Well, the third group of people Jesus is describing are what I call the dabblers. Verse 14, and as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Now, dabblers are an interesting bunch. They are nominal Christians. They're Christians in name only. They are the, the goats among the sheep, the tares among the wheat. They are false brothers. They have an intellectual understanding of the gospel, and like the defectors, they've made a profession of faith somewhere along the way, but instead of falling away, they just hang around the church, around the edges, and they dabble in spiritual things, but they never grow, they never mature, they never change. They're relatively good people, much like their neighbors. They give lip service to the importance of their faith, but there's nothing distinctive about their lives that would identify them as a follower of Jesus Christ. The things of this world consume their time and energy, things like politics, finances, hobbies, careers, family, health. These aren't bad things by any means, but all of them seem to be more important to them than the pursuit of righteousness and godliness and personal holiness. Their spiritual life and vitality have been choked out by the weeds and thorns of this world. Now, Jesus lists three fatal distractions that choke out their spiritual growth. First, he mentions cares. This is just general anxiety and worries about life. It's being constantly pulled in different directions by competing priorities and demands on our time and energy and resources. Some call this the tyranny of the urgent. Second, Jesus mentions riches. These people are focused on seeking wealth and financial security, acquiring earthly goods and possessions. What do we eat? What do we drink? With what do we clothe ourselves? They cannot serve God because they worship money. And then third, Jesus mentions the, the pleasures of life, pursuing leisure and comfort, recreation, and just wanting to enjoy the good things. A telltale sign of a dabbler is that when things get really busy and the pressures of life start squeezing in, the first thing they drop from their schedules are the things of the Lord. They skip church because they planned something else for Sunday mornings. They're too busy to join a small group. They can't serve because they've got more important things to do. They're committed to their church as long as it doesn't interfere with their other priorities. Those are dabblers. The Apostle John calls these priorities the, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he said that they are all that is in the world, and that if these are your priorities, if these are the things that you love, then the love of the Father is not in you. This is idolatry. There's no fruit. These spiritual dab dabblers are choked by the weeds and they eventually will die out. Hebrews 2, 1 through 3 says, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, 
and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Now, you may be thinking, Denny, from what you're saying, it sounds to me like it's possible for someone to lose their salvation. And some have taken it to mean just that, but please don't misunderstand. This is not what Jesus is talking about by any means. What he's teaching here is that not all conversions are true conversions. Some conversions are spurious and give no evidence of being genuine. Jesus is not giving us examples of people who have lost their salvation. You cannot lose what you never had. And by the same token, you can never lose what God has guaranteed to give to you and seal it with an oath. Jesus is describing people who claim to be believers and self-identify as Christians, but their lives give no evidence that they've been born again and that they have eternal life. There's, a trem there's tremendous pressure from our morally depraved, politically correct culture to embrace the notion that you're free to be whatever you imagine yourself to be and can self-identify as something that you're not, regardless of all the evidence to the contrary. In the same way, identifying as a Christian doesn't mean that you are one, especially when there's no evidence to back up your claim. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. And in each of the responses that we've examined so far, the deniers, the defectors, and the dabblers, there's no fruit to examine. But then we come to the last group, the disciples. Verse 15, as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Now, these are authentic Christians. These are the ones who hear the gospel, take it to heart, and their lives are transformed. They are born again and genuinely converted. They, are, they hear the gospel, they believe the gospel, and through faith and perseverance, they bear fruit for the gospel, and they endure to the end. There's not, theirs is not just an intellectual understanding of the gospel. They believe it with an honest and good heart. Does that strike you as odd? An honest and good heart? Because it seems that whenever we talk about the condition of our hearts, someone will invariably bring up Jeremiah 17, 9, which says, the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In other words, even if you are a Christian, even if you're a Christian, there's nothing more deceitful and wicked than your own sinfully malignant heart, and that malignancy is incurable. It seems to me that a deceitful and desperately wicked heart is the polar opposite of an honest and good heart. In fact, the two descriptions of the human heart are diametrically opposed, incompatible and mutually exclusive. It's either one or the other. It can't be both. So what, Jesus, so what is Jesus talking about here? Well, there's a, there's a basic principle of biblical interpretation that I want you to grasp. And you'll hear it now, you'll probably hear it again. The principle is this. If you find something in the Bible that conflicts with what you believe, you need to change what you believe so that it conforms to the Bible rather than trying to force the Bible to conform to what you believe. See, Jesus tells us that if you're a believer, you have an honest and good heart. What is the honest and good heart? And where does it come from? Well, it's promised to us as a, as a free gift in the New Covenant. In Ezekiel 36, verses 25 through 27, God details eight things that he does to us when we are born again. Eight things he does to us miraculously in what we call regeneration. He says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you 
and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. That's the Jeremiah 17 heart. And I will give you a heart of flesh. That's the honest and good heart that Jesus is talking about here. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You can go back and listen to this again and count them. It's eight things. This is a description of the reality of the miracle of regeneration. That's what happens to us when we're born again. You have an honest and good heart if you're a believer this morning. You've been given a new heart, a heart sprinkled clean from all the defilement of sin and unrighteousness, no longer a cold, dead heart of stone, but an upright and tender heart of flesh fully devoted to loving and serving Christ. A heart that Mark says receives the word. Matthew says it's a heart that understands the word. And Luke says it's an honest and good heart that keeps and obeys God's word. These transformed people indwelt by the Holy Spirit produce mature fruit while steadfastly maintaining and preserving in faith until the end. When the word of God is proclaimed, those who have ears to hear must respond in faith and repentance in order to be saved. And those who are deniers and do not believe the gospel, and those who defect and turn away from Christ, and those who dabble in religious things and do not endure to the end are lost. That's the point of this parable. Only those who hear the gospel and receive it with an honest and good heart and persevere to the end will be saved. Would you pray with me? We thank you, Father, for the clarity of this simple story that Jesus told to these gathering crowds that um, came to hear him speak. We pray, Father, that we would be among those this morning who have ears to hear and would listen and that the seed would be implanted within us and that we would receive it with an honest and good heart. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.